We are in the book of Revelation, and we are in that portion of the book which, upon first reading, appears notoriously difficult. I don't know whether you're like me, but as a new Christian, I wasn't too long before I drifted into the book of Revelation, and I said, I'm just going to read through this thing real quick, and I got through it, and I said, I don't understand much of anything that's going on here. But as we have seen, the book is only difficult because, number one, we do not know our Bibles, and number two, we do not see the covenantal context, even if we do know our way around the Bible. We have seen that the strange language used is not strange at all. It is the language of the temple worship, which we see, and the language of covenantal judgment, which we see. And that is used throughout the Bible from Genesis clear through Revelation. Chapter 1 we saw was an introduction to the book as well as an outline of the book of Revelation. John is on the Isle of Patmos and he receives the revelation of Jesus Christ and that is what the theme of the book is. The revealing of Jesus Christ in all of his glory. We see that he is the Lord over the totality of life and of all of history. He is Lord over everything. Then we see this come to light in chapters 2 and 3, which are letters from the Lord Jesus to the real churches, the seven churches in Asia Minor. And we know that he has lordship over history because each of the seven letters is really custom made. He understands the churches. He knows their geographical setting. He knows their industry. He knows their trade unions. He knows the persecution that they are going through or the conformity and friendship to the world around them. And he knows the synagogue of Satan and the corrupt Jewish leadership and the political climate of Caesar. And he takes all of these things and weaves them into letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And he lets the churches know that there is no king but Jesus. He is the Lord over the totality of life. There is no king but Jesus. Jesus, and there is none under heaven and earth which must be worshipped. And in chapter 4, we are transported then to the heavenlies, where we see Jesus worship in his glorified state, and we see the true worship of Israel as it is taking place in the heavenlies in chapter 4. This worship is totally Christocentric. It's not man-centered. It is totally Christocentric as our worship here should be. And we saw that it was incredibly beautiful, it was incredibly noisy, and it was an astonishing sight. It was sensory overload, and is sensory overload, because we're still in that worship service. There's thunder and lightning and truth and beauty and goodness. And they all come together as they worship Jesus. And in chapter 5, Chapter 5 is the vision of Christ himself, the lamb as though slain, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and the only one worthy to receive the scroll, the scroll which is written on both sides, and we discovered how that scroll is really the covenant, and are the seal with seven seals, and he is the only one worthy to unseal it. Then in chapter 6, we see the breaking of the seals, and we see the integration of all of biblical history culminate in this. We see the seven seals, and they really correlate to the seven days of creation and to the seven festivals which are correlated to creation. And what we see take place as the seals are open is a decreation occurring. There's war, there's international strife, there's famine, there's pestilence, there's persecution, there's earthquake, there's a decreation going on. But it is a common language, we found out, of covenantal judgment on the religious leadership of Israel. All the images, such as the moon turned to blood, are drawn from Scripture, associated with God's judgment against his own covenant people. It's not new language. But oftentimes we come to the book of Revelation and we read it in isolation. But it really isn't isolated. It is the language found in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Nahum, Micah, Joel. All of those describe judgments that were historically fulfilled. And they are described in the terms we see here in Revelation. The same language. The book may be difficult, 
but it is certainly not mysterious as people make it out to be. It's the language used to describe that event. Well, later on, we'll come to a description of horsemen, and I've seen explanation of these horsemen, and that, that there must be some type of tank with fire coming out of the tank, and, and just uh, you know this vivid imagination. I appreciate the imagination, but it's not the language of the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar's horsemen are described in that fashion. It's the judgment of the day. It's, du- it's judgment du jour. But our minds rush to the latest technology to see if it fits this description in Revelation. And we need not do that. We need to turn to our Bibles, we found out. And of course, in chapter 7, we see two visions as part of the sixth seal that's being opened. And God brings to himself a remnant. There is judgment promised against Israel at the end of chapter 6, but God is going to judge Israel and bring the nation to ruin. But that did not mean that he was done with Israel. And he calls out a remnant, 12,000 from each tribe. But as we saw, it was a peculiar people to himself that he calls out. And we saw that from the peculiar lifting of the 12 tribes that we saw there. So he calls the marked ones out to save them. And then the other vision is a remnant from every nation, tongue, and tribe. And they appear before the Lamb and robed in white. And they join in worship. And what this really is, it's the beginning of the new kingdom. And so now we come to Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightning, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. Now we're going to see that there are three sets of judgments in the book of Revelation. And we'll notice that the seventh unpacks to the next seven. In other words, we have the seven seals and the seven seals unfold. And on the seventh seal, that seventh seal unfolds to the seven trumpet judgments. And in the seventh trumpet judgment, we'll see, unfolds to the seven bowl judgments. It's part of the seventh, part of the seventh seal are the seven trumpet judgments. We'll see that the language closely parallels, as we've already seen, Matthew 23 and 24. In Matthew 23, we see how many woes? Seven. Good guess. It's a good guess in the book of Revelation. Seven woes pronounced on the scribes and Pharisees, the leaders of Israel. And in chapter 4, we see how those seven woes will be worked out in Jerusalem, particularly upon the temple, if repentance is not forthcoming. So Revelation is a forefront drama against the backdrop of Matthew 23 and Matthew 24. And we see structure in the creation story, don't we, in Genesis. And we see that in true worship, which is recreation. Well, here we see decreation, which follows the pattern of recreation, which follows the pattern of creation. So it's all tied. It's all tied from beginning to end. Now, the images should be familiar to us as we read these seven trumpet judgments. It's the language of redemption and covenant judgment. And the Bible's rich with imagery, and we need to look at the scriptures rather than what's around us. Well, this all unfolds as a part of the liturgy in heaven as we begin in chapter 8. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. So the final seal is open, and we're told that there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour, which seems like an odd piece of time when you come to the book of Revelation, you say, what in the world is a half, why? <laughs> half an hour? And of course, our imaginations immediately take off and a half an hour must represent 500 years because one day is like a thousand years. <laughs> and we go on and on and on and we try to discern this, what in the world is happening for this half an hour. It seems like such an odd piece until we look at scriptures. 
The seventh seal represents the seventh day. What happens on the seventh day of creation? There's rest. There's rest on the seventh day. It's the liturgy in heaven unfolding. It's the worship of Israel in heaven. And we can see this elsewhere. We see this elsewhere. Who knows where we see this half hour in Scripture? Zacharias, Luke, chapter 1, verse 10. Zacharias is in the order of priests that's serving. And so he's serving as the, as the priest and the, as the, the story goes. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And then the story goes on and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the, wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And as we know the story, it goes on and, and of course uh, Zacharias was struck mute. He didn't believe, but Zacharias was in the rotation of the priests. And what's he doing? He goes up to the incense altar, doesn't he? And he meets the angel of the Lord. And so he goes into the holy place burning incense and he offers prayer for, the, for forgiveness of the people. And of course he comes out silent. He was mute till the time of the birth of his son because he, he didn't believe. But what Zacharias was involved in is the same thing that we're seeing here. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense. So this is the same part of the worship service that we're seeing Zacharias perform here. And during that time, there was silence. So we see the same thing in Second Chronicles 29, and verses 28 and 29. Hezekiah and the choirs and the trumpets, they're all there. It's, it's this worship, but they are brought to absolute silence. All of the people were to offer silent prayer while the high priest offers up incense in silence. And this all takes place in about a half an hour. Alfred Edersheim, in his book, The Temple and Its Ministry and Services, describes this in, in detail. And this part of the worship service takes about a half an hour but they're to prepare incense of offering at this particular time. And this is what we're seeing here in Revelation chapter 8. This reminds us that the prayers in chapter 6, verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So we see that this really reminds us of those particular prayers in chapter 6. How long? until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And these prayers are gathered by the high priest. Verse 3, then another angel, it's not one of the seven, but another angel, it's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So it's that part of the temple worship that we're seeing here. He says, so then another angel, Christ himself, takes the groanings of his people and stands before the incense altar. And the high priest receives the prayers of the saints and they are a sweet aroma to the Father. Verse 4, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So he takes the censer and offers, his, and offers it up. And it's an answer to the prayers in chapter 6. How long before you avenge our blood. This is part of the nature of worship. We see it rather boisterous and loud but when, in chapters 4, 5, and 6, but when we come to this portion, there is silence. Then the angel takes the censer, filled with fire from the altars, and throws it to the earth in verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake. So there's thunders and lightnings and, and an earthquake that takes place and Christ responds to the prayers of the saints and the Spirit really falls on the earth and He sends His Spirit on the earth 
and there's going to be a, a spiritual awakening and he's going to stir the earth. But we don't understand worship. We don't understand the importance of worship. The way we would read this, and he takes the sensors, the flyer sensor, and throws it to the earth, and Christians immediately start getting a petition to send to the government to change things. Or we form a, a conservative coalition to change things. Or we do this, or we do that. And we ignore worship. Well, what's happening here? He's taking the prayers of the saints and worship, and he's throwing it to the earth. And it's him that will avenge their blood. We don't understand the importance of worship. As Doug Wilson says, when the people of God learn to worship properly, then the battle will be joined. Then the swords will be drawn. Then the horses will be spurred. Then we can charge. That's why worship is so important. The Spirit falls on the earth and He sends His Spirit to the earth and there's going to be a spiritual awakening and He's going to stir the earth. It's Matthew 23 and 24. There's a warning for Jerusalem. The city is under the ban, much like Sodom and Gomorrah was under the ban. The whole, it's going to be a whole burnt offering to the Lord, Jerusalem is. They have so violated the terms of the covenant that they face irredeemable consequences. But it's God that's going to do this. He's the one that's going to avenge the blood of the saints. We see the same thing in terms of other cities in the Bible, don't we? Jericho's a famous one. They marched around the city how many times? Seven. And they blew the trumpets. New language? No. It's not. It's a city under the ban. Jerusalem is under the ban. Just like Jericho was under the ban. Now the neat thing about the story of, of Jericho, there was incredible redemption occurring there, wasn't there? And we must not forget that there is redemption even in the midst of the ban. Jericho is a perfect example of that. Who was spared? Who was spared in Jericho? Rahab, the harlot, was spared. Rahab's son is Boaz. Boaz marries Ruth, a Moabite. What? They're in the line of the tribe of Judah. They're brought into the Messianic line. Incredible story of redemption in the midst of a band. We can't miss that in the book of Revelation. Now, there are strict rules for a city under the band. Deuteronomy chapter 13, starting in verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 13, starting in verse 12. If you hear someone in one of your cities which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in, saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which you have not known. Then you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of the city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it all that is in it and its livestock with the edge of the sword and you shall gather all its plunder into the middle of the street and completely burn with fire the city and all its plunder. For the Lord your God, it shall be a heat forever. It shall not be built up again. So none of the accursed things shall remain in your, in your hand that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy and have compassion on you and multiply you just as he swore to your fathers, because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God to keep all his commandments which I command you today to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord your God. So there were strict rules for a city under the ban. There was an inquiry to be given. They were to search diligently. But if they were found covenantally unfaithful, everything was to be brought into the square and what? Offered up as a whole burnt offering. Now, the only acceptable way to burn a city as a whole burnt offering, as a whole burnt sacrifice, was with God's fire from the altar. The priests would bring the fire from the altar to burn the city. And we know that there's strict prohibitions from using strange fire, don't we? Leviticus chapter 10, a couple of characters, Nadab and Abihu. The sons of Aaron each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense in it, 
and offered what? Profane fire before the Lord which He had not commanded them. It's strange fire. They didn't get the fire from the altar. The only way to burn a city under the ban to offer a whole burnt sacrifice to God was with God's fire. Strange fire was punishable by death. And so what do we see here in chapter 5? Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So here we have Jerusalem, a city under the ban. The, the prayers of the saints are given to the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. He takes them, he offers them to the Heavenly Father. It's a sweet aroma to him. And he takes the fire from the altar and throws it to the earth. It's a beautiful picture of judgment. It is not strange fire, it is fire from the altar. So then we come to the trumpet judgment, starting in verse 7. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Some of this language we sang this morning in Psalm 18. The second trumpet, the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch and it fell from heaven burning like a torch and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of the water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood and many men died from the waters because it was made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying to the midst of the heavens, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So we come to the trumpet judgments, but we notice that even here there is grace to be found. When we come to the seal judgments, it was a fourth, a quarter of this, a quarter of that. Verse 8, So I looked and behold, a pale horse in the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him. And the power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger and with death and the beast of the earth. Well, here under the trumpet judgments, we see that the judgment has gotten worse, hasn't it? It's gone from a quarter to a third, but nevertheless, there's still mercy to be found. It's a third of the trees and a third of the sea and a third of the living creatures. What he's saying is don't let this come on every head. Repent. There is still mercy to be found. And so judgment comes against Jerusalem and the land, the, the promised land. And here we see the language of Psalm 18, which we sung, Isaiah 13, Ezekiel 32, Amos 8, Nahum 1, Joel 2. It's the exact same language as Habakkuk 2, Micah 3. Their judgments upon the earth or the land or the soil for the first trumpet. We need not be reductionistic and isolate revelation and treat it as if it's never happened anywhere else. It's simply judgment language that's occurring here. And so the first trumpet, it's against the earth or the land, Jerusalem, and it's destroyed uh, by the Romans in their scorched earth methods of warfare. And we see the uh, language of that warfare here. And hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all the grass, and all the green grass was burned up. This is simply judgment language, but it's judgment upon Jerusalem. And Josephus records this scene for us at the uh, coming of the, of the Roman armies and what they did. He said, the countryside, like the city, was a pitiful sight. For once there had been a multitude of trees and parks, there was now an utter wilderness, stripped bare of timber, and no stranger who had seen the old Judea and the glorious suburbs of her capital and now beheld utter desolation could refrain from tears or suppress a groan. At so terrible a change, the war had blotted out every trace of beauty, yet this was only the beginning Josephus mentions many more sorrows and much worse lay ahead. That's Josephus' description on the siege on Jerusalem. And that's what we're seeing here in this first trumpet. 
The second trumpet is against the waters. You can see this in this language in, in Jeremiah. So, but in Revelation 8 it says, And then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. But we see some of the same language in, in Jeremiah uh, chapter 51. Now, verse 25, Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys all the earth, says the Lord, and I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you down from the rocks, and make you a burnt mountain. It's the same language that's being used there. Verse 42 talks about the sea. The sea has come up over Babylon. He's talking about the destruction of Babylon here, but she is covered with a multitude of its waves. So we see the uh, first trumpet against the land and the second trumpet against the waters, against Babylon in, in Jeremiah. It says, In the midst of the waters, the holy Burton mountain is thrown into the sea and will judge all the Babylons of the earth. In Revelation, it says, A third of the people will be uh, destroyed and a third of the commerce will be destroyed. It talks about the ships and, and the uh, things that are within the water. So it's What's happening here is God is speaking of Jerusalem in the same language he once used to speak of Babylon. It's judgment language. Israel was God's holy mountain, the mountain of God's inheritance, Exodus 15:17. Mount Zion is the accepted symbol of the nation, and that's being judged here. The persecuted church began praying for the mountain of Israel to be taken up and cast into the sea. Their offerings were received at God's heavenly altar and in response, God directs His angels to throw down His judgments to the land. That's why worship is so potent. That's why worship is a battering ram against the world. But we want to go out and we want to sign petitions. We want to work within their system thinking we can change their system. But we got it all wrong. It's the worship of God that changes the world. What's he doing? He's taking the prayers of the saints and he turns them into a battering ram. Boom! Don't need no stinking petition. The third trumpet is that of the wormwood water. This is biblical imagery again. It comes from the fall of both Egypt and Babylon. We're also reminded in Ezekiel 47 of the waters coming from the temple. Now, those are healing waters spoken of in Ezekiel 47, the springs and the rivers that come from the temple. Waters come to the ankles and then to the knee and then to the waist and then it was too deep to cross. The increase of God's kingdom throughout time. But wormwood is a term used in the law and the prophets to warn Israel of its destruction as a punishment for apostasy. You can see that in Deuteronomy 29 and Jeremiah 9, Jeremiah 23, Amos 5. But it's also one of the names of Satan. You can see that in Isaiah chapter 14. I'll turn there. How you, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Have you cut down the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation and on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. You shall be brought down to shale to the lowest depths of the pit. But it's another name for Lucifer or for Satan. And there are, and we're going to encounter seven different names for Satan within the book of Revelation. No big surprise. So rather than the waters bringing life like in Ezekiel 47... They now bring death and bitterness. And what's taking place is really Ezekiel 4 through 7, chapters 4 through 7 is portrayed where you have the siege of Jerusalem and the, with the sword and, and judgment coming against Jerusalem there. And then we have the fourth trumpet. And it's against the sun, the moon, and the stars. This is essentially all the rulers. Again, this is biblical language. This is the international conflict, beginning of the end of the empires. And it depicts the fall of nations and national rulers. And again, we can see this throughout Scripture. Isaiah 13, Isaiah 24, 34, Ezekiel 32, Joel 2, Acts 2. 
just a quick glance at the Roman Empire tells you this happened. Gaius, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, all died by murder or suicide. So the sun, the moon, and the stars are all referring to national rulers. This is describing something that has already taken place with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It's written, but it's written to give encouragement to the, to the churches of something that will shortly take place, he tells them, when John writes this. But it gives great encouragement. They cry out. Their prayers are heard. They worship God properly. They cry out. Their prayers are offered up as a sweet aroma, as a whole burnt offering, and fire from the censer is taken and then thrown to the earth, and we have judgment upon the earth. And then last, we see an angel, or in some of your versions you may have eagle. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of the heavens, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. You haven't seen anything yet. You haven't seen anything yet. So we see an angel or an eagle fly through the midst of the heaven and he declares three woes on them, on the inhabitants, because of the remaining three trumpets that are about to be blasted. So after many delays and much long suffering by the Lord of hosts, the awful sanctions of the law are finally unleashed against covenant breakers so that Jesus Christ may inherit the kingdoms of the world and bring them into his temple. Well, now we see some of these same things happen around us when we continue in our own way. We too will come under the discipline of God if we continue in our own way and not repent. The gospel should be impacting life, and it should be impacting all of life. It should be impacting science, arts, politics, all of it. The gospel affects all areas of our lives. It's not an invitation to come forward and sign a card and make a decision and then live your life as though nothing ever happened. And that's the church today in America. We don't have a good covenantal concept of what it means to worship God. We ignore worship or we trivialize worship or we think worship is for those we need to make it seeker-friendly and so that people will be comfortable. But let me tell you, those people that come to a seeker-friendly service would not be comfortable with this worship in heaven. They would be very uncomfortable, as they should be. The problem is we seem to be uncomfortable as well because we don't practice worship right. And because we don't practice worship right, we see this nation continue to slide. We're not offering up prayers. I mean, I... You go to this hymnal and you just try to find a hymn in here much like Psalm 18, speaking of the judgment. You're not going to find it. What's the last time you heard an imprecatory song or a prayer prayed in church? How long, O oh Lord? How long? But the right worship of God, and we're going to get, and this is going to continue in a build to a crescendo later on here, and, and, and we'll see this come out more and more, but What we're witnessing here in Revelation is part of the liturgy of the church. And that's why the church took Revelation and used it as the order of liturgy in their worship service. And we'll see that as it comes out. But we need to understand what it is to call people to repentance. It's a call to live in communion and union with God. And it's a call that we won't change the world with our silly petitions, with our silly running around trying to get this politician elected or that politician elected. What will change the world is the right worship of God. Let's pray.